Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast titled GDPR and the Role of the DPO, or Data Protection Officer. This is sponsored by the Data Protection and Capacity Optimization Committee within the Storage Networking Industry Association, otherwise known as NIA. I'm Thomas Rivera, Senior Data Security and Privacy Consultant and the co-chair of the Storage Networking Industry Association's Data Protection Committee. I will be your moderator today, and so let me provide a quick overview before we begin. Today's webcast is designed to encourage audience participation, so the plan is to provide a brief tutorial-style overview of the GDPR and the role of the Data Protection Officer, and then move to a panel discussion with questions from the live audience. The webcast will be available on demand, and a copy of the slides will be uh, available on our SNEA.org website. We ask that you use the BrightTalk platform to ask questions so that our speakers can join in on, on the conversation. And then I will moderate the questions as they come in um, and um, do it in, in a manner to keep the flow going. So before we introduce today's speakers, let me first introduce the group within SNEA that's sponsoring today's webcast. That group is the Data Protection Committee. Uh, the Data Protection Committee is uh, really focused on promoting education and, and uh, best practices that are focused on things like, uh, obviously, data protection, storage-related capacity optimization technologies in addition to data protection and also um, uh, uh, issues of privacy as well. So um, at the end of this webcast, we'll give you some links uh, to access public resources if you're interested in finding out more details. So let's now introduce our speakers. Uh, we have two experts with a deep knowledge of the GDPR regulations. So that you recognize their voices, I'm going to ask each of them to say hello to the audience after I read each of their respective biographies. First is Katie Dix Elsner, Senior Attorney as well as the Global Data Protection Officer for Hitachi Vantara. Katie, please say hello to the audience. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Katie. Uh, next is Eric Hibbert, who is the Chair of the Insights Technical Committee on Cybersecurity, CS1. Eric specializes in security and privacy and is involved in multiple international standards bodies that focus on data security and data privacy. Eric, please say hello to the audience. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Now let's move to a short briefing presentation on GDPR and the role of the Data Protection Officer. Again, for those of you dialing in late, the flow of the webcast will be a short tutorial-style briefing uh, being uh, that will be done by me, and then we'll go into a Q&A uh, with our panelists. So let's go ahead and start the short briefing. First, a, a bit of a summary on what the GDP, GDPR is, the Global Data Protection Regulations. I really won't read the slide. I, I assume that since uh, those of you uh, viewing this webcast are familiar with the GDPR, what it is, and why it, became, why it came about. Uh, the details of the GDPR, however, are uh, uh, listed on this slide, uh, and these are available for reference later as well. So first, a few definitions. You know, what is a data subject? Because, <clears throat> excuse me, within the regulations, the this term data subject is used quite a bit. And, and as it's defined, it's a person uh, that, whose personal data is processed by a controller or a processor, which we will also define, by the way. So, um, uh, of course, one of the other definitions is personal data. Well, of course, as you can imagine, as, as it implies, really personal data is any information that's relating to a person which can be identified either directly or indirectly to that respective person. Um, interesting enough that the personal data could be quite far-reaching, things like things that you wouldn't necessarily expect like uh, IP addresses and, and so on, uh, which is 
brings up some interesting discussions as to um, uh, privacy as it relates to the GDPR regulations. Uh, another term is uh, data processing, and really it's just any operation performed um, on that personal data that's being stored. And another is the data controller, which we mentioned before, and that's really any entity, usually a company, that determines the purposes or the conditions and the means of which the processing takes place of that personal data. And then lastly um, is the, I'm sorry, the, the uh, I, I just skipped a slide here. So uh, we'll go on to the, a little bit on the briefing of the role of the data protection officer. So it's important to define what a data protection officer is. Again, in relation to uh, the definition in the GDPR, it's really an expert on data privacy who works independently uh, to ensure that uh, the company that they are representing is adhering to the policies and procedures that are set forth in the GDPR. So we will probably be using the term DPO or data protection officer. Um, you know what we'll be referring to when we just call it DPO. So in terms of the responsibilities of the data protection officer, uh, you know, these are really the highlights, uh, these five major bullets, you, first being that you ensure the controller and processor and employees understand their obligations. Uh, so obviously there's, a, there's a, um, uh, an understanding that there would be some education involved there as well. Uh, the second major bullet is, you know, monitoring compliance. You know, in terms of responsibilities, there's uh, this element of training, and then, of course, managing audits would be part of this compliance monitoring. That third major bullet in terms of responsibilities is advising um, on the DPIA, which actually stands for Data Protection Impact Assessments, and then monitoring that respective performance of, the, of those uh, assessments. And then the fourth bullet is cooperating with the, the SA or the supervisory authority, uh, which is uh, uh, another person within the GDPR infrastructure that, uh, that deals with uh, um, enforcing regulations. And then lastly, be the contact point within your company as the DPO uh, for the uh, supervisor authority. Now, in terms of the relationship of the DPO to the organization, it's important to note that the role can be contracted versus having someone in-house fill that role. Uh, also, it's an interesting to note that uh, the GDPR regulations stipulate that it's best to have this person report fairly high level and at a high level in the organization um, to make sure that there's uh, high visibility within the company. Uh, for uh, for making sure that the regulations uh, are being complied and uh, and there's no issues uh, going forward from the board perspective. Um, also, the organization, um, you know, the DPO is really the primary liaison as well, as we mentioned before, uh, to the SA or the supervisor supervisory authority. Uh, any co cooperation that takes place for the company that would be uh, handled by the DPO. Um, and then lastly, the um, organization, interesting note, could be fined potentially if a data protection officer is not, uh, is, is not hired or defined within the organization or potentially if the wrong person is, is in that role. Uh, so interesting note that, uh, that there's a potential fine there. From the qualification standpoint, on this slide, I'm mentioning that you know, there's qualifications as it relates to how it's stipulated in the GDPR regulations itself. Basically, a person with expert knowledge of data protection laws. I mean, that's sort of the high level. And you want them to be able to deal with uh, all the data processing operations that are carried out and make sure that they understand um, the um, privacy-related concerns of any data processing of personal data that's happening within that company. Now, what we mention next here is qualifications as suggested, and this is actually sub suggested by the, the working party 
uh, guidance um, for GDPR. And those suggestions uh, of qualifications are kind of obvious in one sense, the first one being expertise in data protection and data privacy laws, and the next being the knowledge of the specific business sector, whatever that company is doing with data, uh, knowledge of the administrative rules and procedures, and then lastly, you want to have the data protection officer being someone of high integrity and professional ethics. So the major tasks that are uh, that are performed by the data protection officer, some of these uh, go into a few things we mentioned already, things like monitoring compliance, advising for data protection impact assessments, um, cooperating with the supervisor authority, pri prioritizing issues based on the risk to the organization, and lastly, some of the record keeping that needs to take place. So. At a, on a summary, the, data, the DPO position or data protection officer position is independent from the rest of the organization. Uh, it's a protected role, meaning it's uh, based on how the regulation is, uh, is written. It's difficult to, to um, have any adverse uh, issues or reactions to the, the position of the DPO. I guess uh, another way of saying that would be it would be difficult to, to fire this person unless there's, there's true negligence or, or a lack of ability. Uh, but also a high degree of autonomy is, is, is required. And you want to be able to have recourse to the highest levels of the organization uh, in the case of w when necessary. Um, when we talk about GDPR, there's always uh, interesting uh, banter about fines and the enforcement of the GDPR. And those are pretty well known now that, uh, uh, that the GDPR has been out for a while, even though it won't officially go into effect until May of next year of 2018. Um, the fines are pretty well known and, and they're listed here. I won't go through them specifically, but um, a lot of people like to talk about the fines that are, that are potentially uh, going to affect any given corporation. So uh, next is we're actually going to uh, go into a panel discussion that, that is the end of our briefing. And uh, so what I'd like you to do in the audience is to um, begin asking questions by clicking the Ask a Question button on the top of the Bright Talk viewing box. Type in your question and then click on Submit. We will answer as many questions as we can during the remaining time that we have. If we can't answer all the questions, we'll answer them by posting a blog on the SMEA.org website. So without further ado, let's begin taking questions from the audience. And uh, wow, we uh, already have some questions coming in. This is good. So uh, I'll pose the first one to Katie. So Katie, uh, how did you end up in the role of the Global Data Protection Officer for Hitachi Ventara? Well, prior to coming to Hitachi Ventara, I worked as an attorney for Littler Mendelssohn and was lucky enough to work with Phil Gordon, who is a well-respected privacy expert in the field. And then I was able to come over to Hitachi Ventara to build on their already very strong foundation of data privacy. And and that has turned into uh, my transitioning into the data protection officer role on a global basis. Oh, excellent. Wonderful. And um, uh, Eric, uh, you're familiar with uh, the, the concept of being a CTO of security and privacy because that's one of your day jobs actually uh, within a company. How did you get involved with things like you know, issues of the effects of GDPR for a company? Well, I think um, one way of looking at it is you mentioned earlier in the briefing uh, the concept of risk and, and um, impact assessments. So that implies that there's an element of security that is underlying um, GDPR and, and privacy regulations in general. So it's, you have to deal with certain security controls to, to be able to deal with data protection. And um, as somebody who deals with products and services for a company, then the, that becomes an important issue 
um, because we need to make sure we've got the right um, features, if you will, to be able to support uh, you know, the customers and consumers of our technologies and services. So that's, that's kind of the, the motivation of, of you know, the crossover between just pure security versus um, you know, sometimes privacy will, will impose um, tweaks to how you might do something. Ah, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful. And um, another question coming in from the audience, um, I'll pose this question to Katie. Are there any issues with having a data protection officer for a multinational company? So I, I think the, the key question is every company needs to determine whether or not it makes sense to have someone on a global basis or someone specific in the EU. And what we determined was under the guidance you referred to earlier, the guidelines on data protection officers that was issued in April of this past year, is that we needed to have someone both on a global basis but also specifically in the EU. So for example, um, the guidance suggests that you have someone who is easily accessible to data subjects and supervisory authorities, um, which has been interpreted to mean someone in the EU. And so we decided to also have someone based in the EU and Spain who can help with that easy access, who can speak the language, who's in the time zone, and that's the determination that our company made. Uh, Katie, this is Paul. Eric, can, just to follow up, if I may, um, in, in doing some of that analysis, um, having um, how your corporate structure is, uh, is assembled, like if you have many subsidiaries and whatnot, does that also play into this? You know, it does, because you want to have someone who is accessible at all levels. And so if you have, you know, subsidiaries outside of the corporate headquarters, it may make sense to have someone who is located either within the subsidiary or at, um, you know, representing all of the subsidiaries. It's a great question. Excellent. Fascinating. Great. Um, so uh, another question coming in is, um, I'll pose this one to Eric first. Um, how is the, the United States reacting to this era of uh, privacy standards? Oh, very interesting. Um, well, as somebody who um, actually is directly involved in the, the development of ISO standards for both uh, cybersecurity and, and privacy, um, that's essentially the, the, the committee that, that I chair. Um, there, the U.S. has historically done a lot of jousting with uh, uh, the Europeans. Part of that is they, they sort of look at the U.S. and almost view us as the anti-privacy zone. Um, and, and so it's very hard for the U.S. to sort of make a point about privacy issues when you're, you're kind of viewed that way. Um, that's not to say that we don't have privacy regulations. It's just it's not all-encompassing as, um, as in some other countries. The one thing I have found kind of intriguing is that, um, by and large, our, our efforts in breach notifications have, uh, have definitely been adopted <laughs> by most of the countries that have a focus on, um, on privacy. So that's one thing that they have picked up from, from the U.S. Um, but in general, the U.S. is you know, attempting to engage in the standardization activities. There's quite a few ISO standards already published in the privacy arena. They don't actually call them privacy. They're, um, they're usually phrased as data protection. Um, and we're seeing right now um, several potentially new activities that are focusing on things like how do you make um, PI disappear um, and, and a bunch of other um, activities that, that seem to be aligned with some of the issues that GDPR is going to impose. Ah, very interesting. Um, so there, there may be, you know, to take that a step further, there may be some the new standards that, that might be coming, emerging as a result of uh, GDPR, potentially? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, the one that's kind of kind of fascinating is <clears throat> there's a there's a new project that's there's a, a ballot out right now, and it's uh, redaction of authentic information. And if you think about that, why would you want to do redactions? Well, how how do you make you know certain PII or PI disappear if you have to do disclosures? And um, you know how do you go about doing that? What's involved? So that's an example of of something that's being balloted right now. Um, but there are, there are several others that are actually being studied. What's significant about this, however, is the development cycle for something like an ISO standard can take on the order of three years. So if it's just starting now, it would be about three years before the standard is actually published. Uh, Eric, Eric the, the GDPR contemplates a certification program. Are you hearing any scuttle in uh, your organizations about what that certification program is going to look like? <clears throat> Um, th there are there are some discussions around uh, what what kind of materials would need to be available um, so that a certification program could be built on it. So the particular committee that is involved with this, which is ISO IEC JTC1 SC27, um, is well known because of its work with the ISO 27001 which is a security um, standard that many organizations actually go off and seek uh, certification on. So given, given that history of that activity, um, th there are some efforts to look at what kind of criteria might need to be um, used as a basis for a certification. And, and I think some of that work that's already been done and it would be in work group five within within SC27 um, could probably be leveraged, um, given that there's heavy participation from from um, most of the European national bodies um, in that in that activity. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, interesting. And I have another uh, question that just came in. What are the implications? Uh, of uh, Brexit from a GDPR perspective. Uh, Kate, do you want to take that one first? Absolutely. So I think this is going to be one of the truly interesting parts of Brexit. So we do know, as of the Queen's speech, that the GDPR will form part of the UK law following the country's withdrawal from the EU. But exactly what that's going to look like is still a bit up in the air. And as it will be outside of the EU, I think we can anticipate that the UK will either go through the adequacy process and seek to obtain adequacy approval from the Working Commission so that data can transfer fairly automatically to the UK, or the UK will be in a similar situation as the US in determining that you either need binding corporate rules a privacy shield certification or something similar, or the model clauses. So I think it's going to be a very interesting part of the Brexit process. So, so Katie, sort of piggybacking on what you said, um, I think it was on the order of two years ago that there was a pretty substantial decision made by the UK judiciary that uh, the citizens of the UK prior to that point had, kind of like in the U.S., no inherent right to privacy. And there was a decision that um, fundamentally changed that. So um, even, even if they were going to sort of shun GDPR, um, they've already, there's already been at least one court decision that uh, has um, kind of put that whole sort of style that they were, they were dealing with have undergone a fundamental change, and they were, you know, not too thrilled about GDPR. At least, you know, conversations I was having. And then after that court decision, it was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess we could follow them. Then. <laughs> have you any any thoughts or comments on that? You know, so I would be surprised if the UK fundamentally shunned the GDPR. I anticipate that we will see something very similar to the GDPR in the UK that might be slightly more business friendly. <laughs> 
Okay, interesting. Uh, that is interesting. Um, we have another question that uh, came in uh, that has to do with uh, data breaches, and kind of a, one question that I hear often, actually, and that is this. What's the specific role of the data protection officer when a company data breach does occur? Uh, Katie, you want to take that one first? Absolutely. I think it's critical that every company has a security incident response team and a security incident response plan, and that may be different company by company, but the DPO should be a part of that response team and help, helping determine whether or not, for example, something is a data breach at the first instance, and if it is a data breach, whether or not notification is required and in which jurisdictions. You know, Tom is sort of uh, r related. Um, the definition of a data breach is also worth noting. Um, when, uh, when we were doing work on the ISO 27040 standard, which deals with storage security, um, it was at a point where GDPR was essentially stabilizing. And um, that, that industry was kind of concerned what, whether there were certain you know, implications or issues that they needed to worry about. So one of the things that, that, that jumped out in the analysis was that it's just not a matter of unauthorized access or disclosure of information that constitutes a data breach, but the thing that got the storage industry um, kind of uh, stirred up a bit was that destroying data or corrupting data um, also constitutes a data breach. So um, there was a pretty significant expansion. So not only is the data that's supposed to be protected fairly broad, but um, what could constitute a data breach is also a bit frightening. And, and that's something organizations that haven't taken a look at this um, could uh, could have some surprises over, and and by the way, the, the definition that ended up getting picked up in 27,040 has subsequently been used in multiple ISO standards, including some of those involved with cloud computing. Ah, that's fascinating. Uh, good, good stuff. Um, the um, question that uh, just came in is kind of an interesting one. It has to do with uh, suppliers. Um, and uh, Katie, I'll, I'll have you uh, go with this one first if you don't mind. The question is this, how is working with suppliers that have access to your customers' PII data affected by GDPR regulations? Well, I think it becomes even more critical that every new vendor goes through a very thorough DPIA process and that you look at the vendor, their potential sub-processors, you know, where their data centers are located, what they are doing with your data, and whether or not they are willing contractually to follow your instructions with, with respect to the personal data. So one um, mechanism that I'm seeing a lot of is having a vendor risk review team, so like a, a SWAT team for vendor risk, and have it include things like business continuity management. You know, do, are there proper business continuity management tools in place? having information security participate in that. So for example, are they encrypting personal data? Where are they storing data? What do the firewalls look like? All of those pieces. And then having privacy be part of that. So for example, do we have the right you know, consent or lawful justification to transfer data to that vendor? You know, do we need approval from data protection authorities? Do we have the right contracts in place? So for example, if the vendor is not certified to the privacy shield, will they enter into model clauses or do they have binding corporate rules? And so I would think that the new, the new world in which we live requires a much more active review of vendors. Oh, good stuff. Great. Um, Eric, anything to add to that one from a supplier perspective? I think you know. I think Katie's covered it well. I, I guess one thing that kind of sparked in you know my mind when she was was describing it is for you know as a company 
um, with employees that are worldwide, uh, are there anything special that we've got to do in terms of handling it? And, and what comes to mind is things like help desks, where you've got somebody from the EU calling into a centralized help desk and simply leaving their name and phone number means we've collected, uh, you know, personal information. I mean, any any thoughts uh, on that? I mean, so instead of just the suppliers, but internally, any adjustments that we've had to make? I think, it, you know, one of the big things is part of the GDPR process and quite frankly as part of good data governance hygiene generally, companies need to be looking at, you know, what what are our processes? Do we have the ability to transfer data from an employee in the, you know, in Ireland calling into a help desk in Colorado, and whether or not we have the ability to transfer that data, and that's something that companies are, you know, looking into with binding corporate rules, with model clauses, and then also within the Privacy Shield certification. So I think that's a, a great extension. Is that, you know, we need to be looking at both internal and external vendors, and internal and external transfers. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. And since you mentioned Privacy Shield, it's kind of a ironic or or maybe just uh, fortunate for us because the question that just came in uh, has to do with the Privacy Shield, and so I'll ask that question. Um, the question is this. What does the Privacy Shield agreement expose uh, any given corporation to? And either of you, feel free to, to comment first. Mm. I think one of... I think one of the main things is that it requires companies to publish their data protection commitments, uh, which makes them enforceable by the Federal Trade Commission. Yeah, that, that would be um, my interpretation as well. Uh, and the FTC, um, although the FTC right now is, is undergone or is undergoing some changes under the Obama administration, um, they were being pretty aggressive when it came to things like um, privacy. Um, I don't know that I've got a, <clears throat> a good sense at the moment as to where where the FTC is about to go. There's some changes happening yep. in, as part of the Trump administration there. Um, so we could see maybe a little less aggressive, um, but I, the FTC – does appear to be the organization that that is kind of the enforcer for these kinds of things. Oh. Interesting stuff. Good. So um, we actually uh, just have a few minutes left, but I, before we close today, one of the uh, ha I have a couple of questions, uh, actually a couple of requests for the audience before we uh, close, and that is, first of all, thank you for participating. Um, uh, the first request is uh, feel free to access the resources from the SNEA.org website, uh, and you'll be able to access quite a bit of information for you and your organization. Also, SNEA is always looking for new members, so feel free to uh, come and uh, participate with us. Um, membership information is available online as well. And uh, secondly, I'd like to ask you to rate today's webcast. and. That's, uh, you can do that by clicking on the rating link at the top of the Bright Talk window. Uh, your feedback is really requested as it will help us in planning future webcasts, and we would really appreciate that. So in closing, I'd like to say thank you for attending today's webcast. Thank you also to our panelists, Katie and Eric, and thank you again for attending, and have a great day.